Before we begin, I'd like to bring out, or I'd like to call out our speaker on Thursday, Joshua Schimmel. We have his book, Your Future on the Faculty, in our education section. They are signed, but he will definitely personalize them for you if you'd like to purchase that. He's very cute. He is yeah, kind of cute, cute with that mustache. She's almost as cute as Maddie. Yeah. So today we are so, so pleased to bring out Gwen Dandridge. She is a wonderful baker, as you will see. She makes pottery, she blows, she makes glassware. She did everything but sell popcorn today. But today we're here to celebrate her writing. She is the author of Stone Lions, The Gin's Jest, and The Dragon's Chosen. And now we're here to hear for her to read her latest book, The Lady of the Tower. Please welcome Gwen Dan. to have you and of course we have Maddie the wonder dog out there um, she's the star of the show usually but today we're focusing on you you've done all this stuff and I just want to know about your childhood were you just a kid that did all kinds of things kids that read you just read I read that's what I did I'm well, what, afraid I was never creative <laughs> I mean, if you've ever seen her pottery it's Gorgeous. Gorgeous. Absolutely. And you do glassware. I do stained glass. And you baking. <laughs> have you tried have you tried the what is the Bulgarian shortbread? Shortbread. Oh. No, maybe I shouldn't say that <laughs> But now you write and I want to know you know where you got your start writing. Oh that's kind of funny. Yeah. Um, a friend of mine uh, was an ab abstract mathematician mm -hmm. over at Dartmouth. And she needed someone to write. She got a big, huge grant, mm -hmm. and she wanted someone to write a story for kids that had math in it to make it oh. accessible. And um, she pointed at me. <laughs> and um, I started, and I thought, oh, I can do this. And then I realized there were a couple of problems. Um, I, I'm math phobic. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and I didn't know how to write. And I thought this might be a slight impediment. But um, we ended up going to the Alhambra mm -hmm. and because for another book that they were doing and I fell totally in love with the Alhambra and she insisted that I, come on Gwen, just write the book. And I was like, oh, how hard can this be? Yeah. It was hard. Um, <laughs> was it the math part that was hard or the writing the book part that was hard? It was, was hard. both. Um, yeah. and, and the history, because it had, had the history right. Um, it mm -hmm. takes place in 1300, late 1300s. <laughs> And so I needed, I spent a lot, 22 books later, of my reading, and I didn't know about, enough about harem life, I didn't know about, I didn't know about anything. <laughs> and so I spent a lot of time researching, and then I wrote it, and then I wrote it again, and then I rewrote it, and then it finally came out. Wow, and then you, did you find that you enjoyed it? Is that why you kept going? Or? No, Anne Lohenkamp, who um, was the world's saint of she was one writers, of was, yes. Um, somebody who loved my book, and she said, you need to keep writing, you, you know, you have one, now you need to get the next one done, and I was like, shoot, um, <laughs> I was done, yeah. and then I wrote, started writing Jin, and then um, it was a book that I had tried to get other people to write a storyline, and no one else seemed willing to do it, so I finally wrote that one. When you have Anne Lohenkamp's seal of approval, that's something. She was such a doll. Yes. Many of you, uh, if you're a local writer, you know, you might know Anne, but you're more familiar with her husband, Shelley, who's a longtime writing coach as well as a writer. But Anne was just a dynamo and she just a wonderful, wonderful person as well. How do you pick your subjects, though? I'm, I want to know. Oh, um, well, still Lyons. I needed to have a child, and I needed to have a, a child that was connected with the Alhambra, and I needed to have a child that could learn um, abstract math, which I had to learn. Um, and so I created the daughter of something. Okay. Um, that's how I Who's on the cover right there? She's on the cover, yeah. and then she continued with Jen's Jest. Mm -hmm. um, with, with dragons, dragons, um, yeah. That one was, that one was from the, I got tired of all the story tells 
with a girl and her fairy godmother, and they were, she was always this perfectly sweet fairy godmother and just so lovely. And I thought, well, what if she weren't, you know, 65 or 75? What if she were like 18 and a feminist, you know, from, the, from Berkeley, you know? <laughs> what if she got involved with a princess and a problem? So that's how she came with it. The lady. Can I ask, is that semi autobiographical? <laughs> no. <Okay. laughs> I've never been a lady. Nor <laughs> Don't call me a lady. <laughs> and Lady came from um, all the stories that have princesses in towers, and they always just hang out there for whatever reason. And I was like, well, what if in this tower there? Unfortunately, wasn't a lady. What if she were really, really the opposite of a lady? What if she were really a very rough tomboy and not well mannered at all? What would happen? So that's how that that evolved. I really like how you placed you put a sense of place in wherever you go to write her on a journey. So. <laughs> I am very excited. I'm going to step aside and let, why don't you share some of the lady in the okay. tower and then we'll take some audience questions. Okay. I'm going to read lady first and then I'm going to read a tiny bit from dragons and just a snippet from Jim. Yeah. This is great. <laughs> from within the mirror, the guardian watched in helpless horror. Six times it had happened, six girls and then six lads drawn up into the tower and locked pair by pair within one of seven paddles bracing the wall. And powerful magician though he had been, his efforts had not made the least difference. The sixth time he did not call out for Rosalind to stop. It would change nothing. His daughter couldn't hear him anymore, or if she did, she didn't respond. His child, whom he loved beyond all things, slept in restless distress, but in her sleep, she entangled others into her magic, dooming them to a half-life within the walls of the tower. All he could do was despair and try to ease the young couple's final days. His gaze shifted from the current lovers fighting the wall's pull to stare again at the seventh panel, the only one remaining empty. If, past, if the past six were any indication, the last girl would arrive within days, and a month or so later, the final boy. He winced as the sixth girl Dulce, the boy who had named her, met his eyes in a desperate plea. He turned his head, unable to bear the scene before him. The lad's arms wrapped about Dulce as though he could defend her against the inevitable. No hope existed. Rosalind's magic was powerful and she listened to no one. The guardian drifted back within the mirror's depth. He couldn't help. All that remained for him was a handful of pitiful spells only enough to give the trap some comfort. He bowed his head. The inn neared for him, for those trapped, and for his daughter. One last time, the final, final panel would fill. And then, chapter one. Light trickled across my eyelids. My dreams had been disturbing, dark and unsettled. I lay in bed, eyes closed, as I tried to remember what was causing my unease, but it skittered across my mind, leaving a distressing blank. I heard the tit tit twee twee of a chit chat warbler outside saluting the morning and then far in the distance, kiki ki ki of a kestrel. Something soft drifted across my face, tickling my nose and cheeks. I blinked open one eye and then the other. Above me, rose colored bed curtains whisked across my face. High above that, 20 feet or more, a curved ceiling spanned the room. Hand covered <coughs> joists divided into eight sections shaped like a bramble rose. Pushing down a film of fear poised to spill into my mind, I turned my head toward the light. A small linen-covered table and a single chair sat before too many paned doors. My eyes caught the wingtip of a swallow as it dashed across the opening to sit, for half an eye's blink at the wrought iron balcony. Steam from a silver teapot married with the intoxicating scent of cinnamon pastry. I raised myself upon my elbows, trying to slow the rapid intake of my breath. Outside the doors, the land fell away. A few tall pines stretched up into the sky before the countryside rolled out into a shrubby glen that moved into woodland. Beyond that, purple mountaintops ascended to meet the horizon. It was Bonnie, if you liked that kind of thing. Did I like that kind of thing? 
I scanned my memory, then tried again. Nothing. My life was bare, stripped like a bed to its ticking. My world before waking today, nothing. I could not even recall my name. My breath caught, fluttered, fluttering like a grouse trapped in a net. I rolled to the edge of the bed, a tinned mirror twice my height and as wide as a wardrobe flanked the far wall facing the bed. I inched toward the overcard frame, terrified of what I would see. Alas, her hair brushed and plaited into two braids of burnished sable, coiled neatly about the nape of her, er, my neck, stared back. I pressed my hands to my mouth and then self-consciously moved them down the pink and buttercup silk gown, watching as the mirror reflected my motions. I stood there staring at this stranger's face, her delicate arched brows over startled blue eyes, a full mouth and a strong chin. I tried to get my bearings, tried to remember if I'd ever looked like this, worn like something, worn something like this before. And my name, what was my name? I peered into the mirror again. The clothes I wore would not hold up against any hard work. And surely I wouldn't have willingly woven so many pastel, pastel covered ribbons through my hair. I thought again, maybe I had liked that at some point. It seemed unlikely. As I watched, the mirror glazed and the, the glass fogged, swirling slowly, violet smoke churning deep within. As a shadowy face emerged, I whirled around, but no one was there. I spun back to face the mirror. May I assist you, my lady? A voice from within the mirror asked, as if it were cloaked by water. I jumped back, tripping over the bottom of my fine silk nightgown. My eyes narrowed. Who was this intruder? I nay your lady, I snapped as I regained my balance. I did not even think I am a lady. But I re-examined the finery that flowed from my shoulders to my feet. Perhaps I was. A shadowed face stared back at me, large hooded eyes, a mouth too tight, almost hidden beneath trimmed gray facial hair. Who are ye? I asked, taking yet another step away from the mirror. Actually, nay, who am I? Disdain curled his lips. You are the lady of the tower. I reassessed my surroundings. I was not a tower. Nay, nay, you misunderstand. What is my name, not where am I? There is no difference, the voice insisted. My fears grew by the minute. What does that mean? This wasn't right. None of this was familiar. Not him, not this room, not even me. My gaze bounced across the different surfaces in the tower, the elaborate murals on each wall, the crystal sconces holding tall ivory-colored col candles. All spoke of riches, lots of it. This did not feel natural. I would have remembered this much luxury, too much. The screamed of magic, and twas a known fact. Magic extracted a price. You belong to the tower, she has claimed you. I clamped my mouth shut and plopped down on my bum, suddenly overwhelmed. Some remote corner of my mind recalled stories of a cursed and enchanted tower, not anything in particular. A whisper of a tinker's sister or the grandniece of a farmer or the distant cousin of a noble who had disappeared. Even remembering that much made my head ache. I searched for a door, a staircase leading out, but saw nothing except the balcony with its picture-perfect picture -perfect view in the long, long drop to the earth. The face in the mirror watched me. There's no way out of here. I bit my tongue, attempting to hold my peace, though to no avail as my questions spilled out. But why am I here? Why cannot I remember my past? Nay, even my name, I insisted. Surely once he said it, I would remember. Have I been ill? Did I fall and bang my head? Now that you belong to the tower, your previous name exists no longer. It's lost and unimportant. He responded with a curt turn of his head. The tower removes memories of Kith and Kim as a kindness. You don't have a past. It's no longer relevant. I swept my eyes across the room. All I saw was froth from the plush patterned carpets covering the floor to the delicate pink of the segmented walls each section painted with elaborate scenes. Tis my life you're speaking of, nascent kingdom's secret. I pointedly glanced around. There is nay else here but me and ye, whoever ye are. I gathered my courage, edging closer to the mirror. Fog shrouded his face. Large feathered moths flapped wildly in my gut. You may call me guardian, the guardian of the tower. His face glowed. Against all reason, I laughed. Some guardian, ye are stuck in the mirror. <coughs> His gaze glided over me again. She shouldn't have selected someone from your station. You're not at all the proper kind of female to grace the tower, no decorum, no sense of property. You don't even speak the king's English. There was even dirt beneath your fingernails when you arrived. I shot a quick glance at my roughened hands, but no more questions. The mirror clouded as he faded back into its depths. Nay, wait, dinner leave. But he did. 
I stepped back from the mirror and peered at myself again. Surely something about my looks would trigger a memory. My face appeared drawn. Wide worried eyes and honey colored skin. Was the color from sun or breeding? I lifted my gown up to my thigh. My skin there was pale and white, unlike the tanned skin on my forearms. I was accustomed to being out in sunlight until most recently. I held up my hands. My fingernails were short and tidied. No dirt remained from my past life, but calluses donned the tips of my left hand fingers. Before I had time to reconsider, I untied the laces and stripped off the gown, stomping it with my feet. I looked again. Even the small clothes were lace covered and pink, pink. I turned my body sideways to the mirror and then swung forward. I was slender, fairly modest on top with no breasts worth binding, a tiny waist and I faced away peering over my shoulder, rounded hips. There were muscles in my arms and here and there a bruise blossomed on my skin. My left forearm sported a series of partially healed scratches running across it. This was not the soft body of a noble. While I watched, the mirror glowed and the guardian reappeared. Shock crossed his countenance before he erupted. Have you no modesty? A bevy of snaps and the clatter of wooden bells sounded from deep within the mirror and the tower walls misted. My neck hair stood at attention. Ghost-like wraiths oozed from each of the murals adorning the walls. They pulled on the floor before rising and moving toward me. My breath caught in my throat. They floated across the floor, hovering over my trodden dress as I backed farther and farther away. The clatter from the mirror snapped again and they solidified, slisting toward me, dragging the gown with their limp white fingers. I made a futile attempt to run, circling the room once until I returned to where I started. The wraiths edged toward me, closing in tighter and tighter to where I stood trembling like a coney beneath a kiting falcon. There was no escaping their hot, damp fingers pressing against my flesh. Accidentally, I looked into their milky eyes and immediately I was lost in deep pools of sorrow and despair. My breath came in deep shuddering gulps as they pulled the gown over my head and laced before I could have whistled the first measures of an eight bar reel. Wow. So that's I'm going to read a very, very short thing from Jen, just because I like it. It's the, it's the prologue. It's really short. Um, As the flames died down to hear a ship step forward, before a second step, she recognized the signs and caught herself. Massive hands with nails curved into claws, ready to crush with a glancing blow. Red eyes glittered with malice, seemed to stare deep within her. Blood pounded in her throat, a bitter taste of bile pressed against her tongue. This was no ordinary djinn, but an ifrit, fierce and wrathful, greater even than the stories. An ifrit, the djinn of legends, as powerful as the stars, and as deadly to humans as molten rock. To hear her pressed Ara and Layla behind her, her breath became shallow and fast as she watched through lowered eyes a blade of fire sizzle, crackle, and then leap straight up the height of five men. There would be no escape. She should, stood in awe and deep reverence, how could she speak with one such as this? Was that what the Ginny was trying to tell her? Not death, no ordeal, but death. It was death staring at her. And to all those who were in this place, if she failed, the girls, those she had led here, all, would all fail. That's Can I do one more? Is that too much? Go for it. <laughs> the sky was songbird blue, the sun golden. A light breeze brushed my cheeks, cooling me down after the uphill gallop. Beneath me, my might, my flare. Beneath me, my mare flight shifted her weight as she pawed the ground. Nothing could be better than this. I turned in my saddle as Crown Prince Theo from Goen, my third suitor this month, thundered up behind me. My reverie ended as he hauled his mount to a stop. Oh, yes. There was one thing that could be improved. You bested me, he nodded to my victory, his eyes lowered, though not before I saw the sullen glint in them. Once again, I'd let my pride rule when I should have stoked my suitor's self-worth. I used my smile to soften his loss. Mother had sent us off, properly chaperoned by the ladies, my ladies and guards, but they fell behind once our challenge began. 
As good a horse as the prince rode, I had no doubt I would win. These were my lands. White and I had traversed them together since my father gifted her to me in honor of my 14th year. We knew every hillock, fence, and ditch. But I shouldn't have beat him. I knew mother hoped he would confirm his offer on, for me today and that I would stop finding excuses to reject orders and accept. It was but chance. You are the much better rider. I slid my gaze to my reins so he could not read the lie in my face. Mayhaps he would see my behavior as a young maiden's modesty. He brightened then, throwing off his bad humor. He was pleasant and attractive, though somewhat too sure of my answer to be flattering. I didn't understand my parents' sudden push to get me engaged. It wasn't likely I would die an old maid, not at the age of 16 in Crown Princess of Verdot. Not when we were, nor were we on the verge of war in my trough needed for the price of peace. Flight still pranced in place beneath my hands, as if pleased with herself for besting Theo's large bay hunter, Lionheart. Theo dismounted, walked over to me, and placed his hand on Flight's bridle, Genevieve. His other hand wrapped around mine as if in ownership. Here it comes, I thought. I knew I would say yes. There were no more reasons to refuse. He was nice enough, wealthy enough, royal enough, and his lands abutted ours. I couldn't protest that he was ill-favored or unsuitable. Father had approved this union, and my mother was eager to see me affianced. Most of all, it was my duty, how I'd been trained all my life. Still, I wished for something more, romance, even love, perhaps. A small sigh escaped my lips, what a foolish thought. A princess shouldn't wish for these. I looked out to the fields beyond. Beyond the field came one of my father's riders on a mission, a cloud of dust blossoming in his wake. In his wake. Noting my distraction as the rider joined my guard, Theo squeezed my fingers. I wouldn't let my family down by refusing. I curled my hands in his, smiling, showing him nothing but a girl delighting in his presence. Genevieve, he repeated, I would. Your Highness, a voice called as three guards charged up the hill. My ladies remained milling around the tree line below, too timid to brave this route. A frothed horse and rider broached the hillside. Princess, you must return immediately. Your father wishes you to attend him. What is this about, Theo demanded. The rider brushed the sweat from his face. I wasn't told, my lord, only that the princess must return. Theo's hand slid from mine. As he, dismount, as he mounted his horse, I blew him a kiss. A little weight would do him good. He was too sure of me, and I was not so sure of him. Whatever father wanted, I was grateful for the reprieve. I sailed into court, followed by the kittenish antics of my ladies-in-waiting. I no longer remember what they were saying that made me laugh out loud as I came before my father's gaze, but I stopped suddenly at the quiet and the look on his face. I scanned the room, hoping for some clue to the disaster that must have hit my kingdom. Our priestess, Mother Morrigan, perched like a bird of prey in the shadows, which was ominous in itself, as she had only appeared in court when tithes were gathered or someone died. I wondered then if someone had died. It certainly felt so. The three traveling musicians played a melancholy tone a tune in the corner. The handsome one, the, the handsomest one with the neat beard, cut to a point, stared at his feet as I walked past, no shy smile as the usual. My sister Danielle was leaning into my mother's shoulder, sobbing. My two little brothers, Harold and Bartholomew, stood with their tutor by the sign lines, alarmingly still. I searched my mother's face and grew more afraid. She was rigid. Her face splotched, the queen who never wore her nations in public. My ladies fell back. I walked forward to kneel at my father's feet. Mother Morgan moved to stand beside my side. As my head rose, I felt her place a delicate chain about my neck. I lifted it to see a dragon etched in the gold brown coin. My question was answered. It was I who had died. <laughs> Wonderful. Does anybody have any questions for Gwen? Yes. Uh, so in the Lady of the Tower, you have birds woven all through. We've just heard about a whole bunch in that first chapter. <laughs> My favorite character in the book is a raven. Yes. And I wondered how you learned so much about ravens and wove that in um, as another character. I read, again, a zillion books, <laughs> which is what I do. There's a number of very good, good books on cor corvids and their abilities and antics and how they're doing. I also had a blue jay as a kid that was wild, and I had um, a couple of other birds that were wild that came into my um, 
hands. And so I know a little bit about them, not much. But that's how I did that. Really nice addition to the book. Thank you. I enjoyed them all. Thank you. Thanks. Yes. Hi. Hi. Jill. Do you have a question? No, I love them both. Oh. <laughs> I'm very grateful. Anybody else have questions? Yes. I'm curious about the age level that these are aimed towards. I know each one. So Stone Lions is the youngest. It's about fourth grade. Uh, Jen's Jest is probably very close to that. It's it's maybe a little bit older, but it's um, and both Stone Lions and Jen are math books. They teach math. Um, this teaches. I I brought just in case somebody forced me to. Um, <laughs> to prove that I knew how to do abstract math. Um, and Jin Jess's sequences, and please nobody ask me to do sequences because I won't be able to. Um, and uh, let's see, where is it? Lady is twi a tween book, so it's 11, 12, 13, 14. And Dragons is the oldest, it's a young adult, which is young adults of I wanted to thank Michael and the, all the staff of Chaucer's for inviting me. It was so kind. And I also yeah. wanted to thank Angela, if she's here, I know she's here, for um, she didn't do the artwork, but she did the design cover for me, oh. and it's just beautiful. I'm very proud of that. And that's it. Gwen Dandridge, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you.